The specific weed we're going to talk about is tumble windmill grass. Uh, if you're not familiar, I'll give you some specifics on that, but uh, it's a beast. And from our poster session, I know some of you guys do have terrible trouble with it. So hopefully after today's session, you can leave here with some ideas on how you can control it. Okay, so some background on our Oklahoma tillage changes that we've seen through the years. From 2000 to 2004, we clocked in with like 50% conventional till acres. In, in opposition to that, we had about 20% no-till taker, no-till acres, I'm sorry. Whenever we look at our most recent data from 2017, however, we're seeing a pretty big shift. We're now at 35% conventional till and 35% no-till. This change in our no-till acres has likely made way for a change in our weed patterns, um, and this disturbance pattern uh, does usually make way for invasions. As you guys know, this is the same story you probably hear most of the time when you're here. Our no-till systems do rely heavily on chemical control, and our weeds that do not respond well to chemical control tend to be a problem in these systems. Tumble windmill grass, Sorry, one second. Anyway, tumble windmill grass does fall into this category. All right, there we go. Um, as it does not generally respond well to herbicides. That's just a metabolic problem with this weed. It's not necessarily herbicide resistant. It's just something that the weed naturally possesses that does make it um, not respond well to herbicides. Some other things you probably want to know about tumble windmill grass. It is native to the United States. It's our warm season perennial bunch grass. One unique thing about it that maybe is a little bit in opposition to what you heard me say this morning is it's shallow rooted. When we think of weeds we want to control with our sweet plow, we're generally thinking our deep rooted perennial grasses. This one is shallow to medium rooted per se, but we still find sweep is pretty effective for it. Another note, cattle generally will not consume tumble windmill grass. If you're running dual purpose acres, this can kind of become an antagonistic problem. You have it in your field, your cattle won't graze it. Competition only gets worse between it and your crop. So just a note, um, cattle aren't gonna eat it out of your pasture for you. Um, and again, it is difficult to control with our herbicide once it's established. This established part is also key when we're thinking about when and how to manage it. In the seedling stage, there is literature that shows it can be controlled with a few different types of uh, pre-emergent herbicides. I'm going to be honest with you, we didn't really look at that in this study because we're mostly trying to target no-till no systems with established stands of tumble windmill. Okay, so we know it's a problem. We know that our no-till acres are increasing, and we, we know we can't really control it. We haven't really found a good system to do this. So... When I entered this program, that kind of became what I thought was going to be a side project that has now morphed into more of my whole project. Um, essentially, we're trying to find a system that balances our no-till benefits, those conservation ideals that we're trying to keep on our farm with management of this weed. So bearing that in mind, the studies we're going to talk about today looked at evaluating the efficacy of sweep tillage uh, for control of tumble windmill grass. Okay, you already heard some of this from this morning. For today's talk, or this afternoon's talk, we're just gonna look at uh, that site outside of Stillwater, LCB, and that on-farm location in Wakita. We're gonna look at the occasional sweep and multiple sweep studies that I mentioned this morning. We're just gonna look at that weed control side of them. A few more notes. Uh, we applied tillage, and then if there was a herbicide treatment associated, we did apply that four weeks after tillage for the initial application, and then if Paraquat was involved, we applied that two to three weeks later. All right, I'm gonna let you guys in on a secret. All of the treatments, all the herbicide treatments for these studies came from Twitter. And I'm not kidding, they really did come from Twitter, but what I mean is from producers on the internet that told us what worked for them. Um, as far as I know, they were all located out of Oklahoma, and whenever we got to thinking about how to do this study, we took input from those producers and put it straight to work that summer. So we, our herbicide program is a little bit limited, but 
we did try to take your guys' input and put it into research. Um, just another note, we did use 15 GPA as our spray volume, and the measurements we're going to talk about today are a few different timings of visual weed control, one weed biomass event, and some wheat yield. So to give you a visual of what it looked like after our applications were put out, this is like probably around two weeks after tillage, without any herbicides applied. Sweep tillage here, very clear cut. As I mentioned this morning, you can definitely see where we've been with our sweep implement. This tillage, um, I'll tell you this again in a minute, but we decided not to apply any herbicides because there was really nothing to apply them to. Our disc tillage was very effective in getting rid of all of our uh, plant vegetation. So because the herbicides we chose didn't have residual, there was really no need for herbicides if for the purpose of the study. Um, and then no-till, this is a beautiful stand of healthy uh, tumbleweed grass growing over here. Okay, so like I said, our herbicides were a little bit limited. We basically have two rates of glyphosate, a low rate at 32 ounces per acre and a high rate at 42 ounces per acre. For this low weight rate, we did choose to tank mix it with glyphosate. Um, the idea here was that low rate of glyphosate and the 2,4-D and dicamba hopefully controlling any broadleaves that we have that are issues in the system. Compared to this high rate of glyphosate followed by paraquat, that seems to be the going treatment. If somebody has tumble windmill grass, this is generally what they've told me that they've tried to control it with. So it was almost what you would consider our standard treatment to compare to. On your glyphosate, what poundage did you use? Four pound or six pound? Four. I think, hold on, I'll think on it. Can I tell you it did? I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll get back to you on that, I guess, if I change my mind. Um, and then we also had a treatment of clethodim at 32 ounces per acre and 2,4-D plus dicamba take mixed with that, uh, followed by paraquat. This is another one that um, folks get pretty excited about and tell us that they've tried. One thing we didn't really realize till later on is that you can sometimes see antagonism between those auxins and the clethodim on grasses. Um, I think we did observe that here, but you know, limited years of research. I guess if we were going to do this again, I would probably take out those auxins and try again, see if we had better control. Okay, so those herbicides, same three herbicides were applied to no-till and to sweep. Again, DISC, we didn't have any herbicide treatments because there was nothing to apply to. So this is the first study, sweep, DISC, no-till. Just like this morning, we did have one other study where we looked at multiple passes of sweep. Um, the key piece of information I didn't give you this morning is that we did have a glyphosate treatment there followed by paraquat. Getting right into the weed control, what we've observed, oh, hold on, let me go back up. This is our still water relocation in 2020. You're gonna notice the, some differences among our weed control between 2020, 2021, and 2022. Personally, I see a lot of that, um, perhaps due to our weather that we had those years. 2020 was wetter. 2021 was like almost optimum as far as getting into the field, getting things sprayed and being timely. 2022, we were in a drought. It was hard to control anything. So bear that in mind as we look at these results. Um, the next several slides are gonna be set up in a similar way. We're gonna have our y-axis here with our tumble windmill grass given in percent visual control. Our x-axis is given, uh, it's separated into our sweep treatments are always going to be over here on the left, and they're going to be in that same herbicide order. This is the low rate, the high rate of glyphosate, and then that clethodim. No-till follows in that same pattern. So sweep, overall, pretty good control. We're looking at over 90%. I should also mention um, this visual rating came at about planting time for, uh, for this area. You're, it says 15 weeks after tillage here. We tilled in early, to, or I'm sorry, we tilled in mid-June. We sprayed three weeks later. We sprayed paraquat after that. So it's easiest for me to just tell you this rating's from planting. This is what the field would look like when you go to plant your wheat. Okay. Sweep, reasonably good control. We're looking at 90-ish percent. Disc, which I know is almost a dirty word, as somebody mentioned to me earlier. Ooh, tillage. This had honestly very good control of tumble windmill grass, but we all know 
getting a, folks to break out a disc to control a weed is going to be a tough job. So it's more of a comparison treatment. And then we look at our, our no-till over here. And we see some interesting things. Like I mentioned, that clethodim treatment just doesn't really impress me much. Uh, our glyphosate at either rate really didn't do what we were hoping it, for it to do. So I don't know, after year one, I would say I was left with more questions than answers. So Dr. Arnold was gracious enough to let us use a site in Stillwater, and the next year, we moved to Wakita. We observed very similar results in Wakita. However, when we start to look at our no-till, we do have some different things going on here. Most notably, this increase in control uh, in our higher rate of glyphosate followed by paraquat, which is encouraging. For our no-till producers that are not willing to break out steel, this might be their best bet. Um, we notice similar trends here with sweep across all of our herbicide treatments. Um, disc, same story. So, moving into our multiple sweep pass study. This is, the black bars are still water, the orange bars are Wakita. Uh, I have three years of data, but there's definitely a trend here. What we notice is that sweep helps compared to no-till, um, and by golly, two or three times doesn't hurt. So again, these are sweep tillage alone. There's no herbicides involved in these ones. So if you're looking for a system to move away from chemical or just something to supplement your system, this could be a really good option. Looking at some tumble windmill grass biomass collections. These were done in the spring just prior to harvest, so this is about one of our wheats heading out. Something to note, although we do see visual control with clethodim that's certainly reduced, we thought we still did control it to some level. From a biomass standpoint, we certainly still have plants in the field that are competing with our crop. Um, and in a minute when we look at yield, we might not see statistical differences based on this, but I think over time you certainly could. So moving into yield, um, as I told you guys this morning, this still water location was treated with tillage one time, and then we observed it for a second year. Something interesting here is that I was able to combine years based on one year of tillage um, that the yield, the, excuse me, the yield in the uh, summer after the tillage happened was so similar to the first year that there was no statistical difference between the years. And that second year, although we didn't apply tillage, there were some maintenance applications done, um, not specifically targeting tumble windmill grass, but just other weeds in general. Um, and basically what we noticed here is that, although I, I'm gonna highlight this clethodim treatment again, Although this clethodim treatment did see a, reduce, a, a reduction in our visual control, we're really not losing much to yield here. So what this tells me is if you have some other grasses in your system and you need to include clethodim, you might be able to get some value out of it to, to reduce some of that competition. You're certainly not going to get rid of your tumble windmill grass entirely, but it might help in the long game if you in, implement some other strategies as well. Um, when we look at our sweep, we do see an interesting reduction in yield right here. This is one of our better treatments as far as weed control. We do have a slight decrease in yield. That's an interesting uh, thing. Moving to Wakita. This is where our soil type definitely comes into play. As I mentioned this morning, the chemical and physical properties that play in our soil have a lot to do with how it's going to respond to that sweep. Uh, what we observed here is that there were no statistical differences between any of these treatments. In yield, um, even though this one is quite a bit lower, still not observing much. This could also be due to the drought. This is just pretty, pretty not great wheat. So, All right. You guys saw very similar data to this this morning. Yet again, we don't see any uh, yield difference among our treatments whenever we look at multiple passes of sweep. So whether you go out once, twice, three times, it's all the same compared to no-till statistically. Okay, let's so move into discussion. So, so far what this data has told us is that sweep tillage does provide greater control than herbicide alone um, across both sites in both years. As I mentioned this morning, our wheat yield was not negatively impacted by sweep tillage, which is encouraging if we're looking for a way to control tumble windmill grass, we want to know if we're going to lose yield to having it compete with our crop, 
What are we going to lose if we try to control it? Sweep tillage looks like we're looking more on the benefit side. Um, Distill did provide greater than 92% control, but as I mentioned earlier, pardon? How many times did you disc? Excellent question. How many times did I disc? We dissed um, like once in late June, and then we dissed once per month until planting. And part of that was because we didn't apply herbicides, um, and we felt that that's likely what a producer would do, and we were trying to mimic a producer behavior with that. Um, looking at sweep, one important thing here when we're considering sweep and spraying this tumble windmill grass is I tried to time a lot of my applications on rainfall. As you know, in 2022, that was really hard. So some of these um, herbicide applications did get pretty spaced out this year, but we still saw reasonably good control, 92% four weeks after herbicide application in 2022. So I'm, I'm relatively satisfied with that. All of these uh, study locations were historically no-till, 10 years or more no-till, and they had thick stands of tumble windmill grass. So if I can reduce that stand by 92%, I feel pretty good about what I've done. So again, drought conditions this year certainly did challenge our management. Um, moving forward, like I said, we would probably increase some herbicide treatments to better account for different options in our area, but this is just getting us started for now. And if you came and talked to me during the poster session, you know I'm trying to collect some data on this. I told you what I've done for the last three years, but personally, I feel like it's such a small aspect of what could be done. So if you have trouble with tumbleweed millgrass, I would really appreciate it if you would take this study, it's a, or, I'm sorry, take this survey. It's only eight questions, and I'm really asking you, what county do you uh, crop in? Do you use a crop rotation? And I have a few different crops listed for you to choose. Um, and do you have trouble with it? And if you've tried to control it, what have you used? I'm just trying to get a better gauge for in the future what we can do to better manage the Swede and also you know, create a better program to let others know good methods to manage it. So in summary, our take home message is, sweep tillage effectively controls tumble windmill grass. I know a lot of people in here probably aren't excited about the idea of breaking out steel again to control a weed, but if we're looking for an option and chemicals can't do it, I hope that this can be an intermediate option for those who do have it available. Uh, this project was supported by RAIN, uh, which comes through the Agriculture and Food Research Initiative uh, competitive grant program. And I would also like to thank the OSU Weed Science Lab for their help in completing this project. And with that, I would like to open the floor for questions. Great. Yes. Four pound? OK, thank you. What? Oh, uh, he said the product that we use for glyphosate is four pounds, which is in relation to the question this gentleman had up front. Thank you for asking that. Yes, sir. Whenever I made the rate table, I debated on whether to do pounds of AI per acre, but most people ask me in ounces, so I'm glad you brought it up. Thank you. Have you looked into any of the other older grass herbicides and soybeans with this besides both of them? So, or, or is your study just specifically for these herbicides? This study is specifically for these herbicides, but you do bring up a good point. There is literature out there that shows Soil residuals can control it at seedling stages. Um, there's actually a pretty long list. Like you said, definitely some soybean herbicides in there. Um, when it's established, the, reach, the literature still isn't very good. We don't know what will cover it. So, Mine is post plus. Say it. Post plus. Post plus. Excellent point. I, I don't have the data to back it up, but I wouldn't doubt it. OK, any other questions? Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Anything.
push okay. down the screen. Perfect. You're right, Dr. Rowley, you've aged well compared to that picture. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I'll get started. Thank you for that introduction, Dr. Arnell. My name is Jenny Dudak. I'm a PhD student here at OSU um, in the agronomy department, kind of focusing on weed science. And I'm actually going to talk to you all this afternoon about accent flex technology in cotton, kind of from a weed science perspective. So the herbicide that they're going to target with this accent flex technology is Elite 27, common name isoxaflutol. It's a group 27 HPPD inhibitor. A lot of times people just call those bleachers. And you all have to bear with me for this. I created this diagram to kind of help explain how isoxaflutol works. Um, mind my uh, PowerPoint plants on here. But you see here the first step is applying the herbicide. So we'll get into that a little bit later on when you can apply. Um, and the second step here is after the application. So isoxaflutol has the ability to sit on top of the soil which you see here, and then when it sits on top of the soil, it can enter into the uh, shoot tissue of those emerging weeds. It also has some ability that I've read for foliar um, entrance into plants after you spray, but the biggest way or the most important way that isoxaflutol gets into the plant is through the root system. And so basically that molecule, that isoxaflutol, will sit on the soil as soon as it hits water, It'll go down through the soil into the roots, and then it'll get taken up by the plant. And so once it's in the plant, something that makes it kind of important is that it moves both through the, the xylem and the phloem, so those two, the two being within the plant. And that kind of helps with rapid translocation throughout the plant. Once it's in the plant, it translocates to the target area. And once it's in that target area, the way that it actually works is that it disrupts um, carotenoid or um, carotenoid, however y'all want to pronounce that, production, pigment production. And carotenoids are actually, so not only are they there to make your carrots yellow, they're actually also there to kind of act as a sunblock for chlorophyll molecules or pigments. And if you have disrupted production of those carotenoids, it is going to, you're going to lose sunblock on those chlorophyll molecules and then eventually the sun is actually going to bleach the chlorophyll, which is where you get the white bleaching from. So the half-life of isoxaflutol is highly dependent on environmental factors like soil moisture. When you have increased moisture, you have lower persistence of isoxaflutol in the soil or lower, lower half-life. And BASF was actually very gracious to send me some slides and I kind of cherry-picked some information from them. Um, the first thing I wanted to point out was the water solubility and soil activation. They did a good job of putting these kind of in order with some common herbicides that you might know to kind of make it a little bit more relatable. So from order from most soluble to least soluble, we have staple or reflex, metallochlors, warrant, cauterian, diuron, caparol, break, and then finally we'll see our elite 27 there, and then next to prowl. And as far as soil activation, this list is in increasing amounts of rainfall needed for that activation. So we've got Outlook on one end, and then you have Elite 27 in the middle, and then kind of comparing that to Prowl as well. Isoxaflutol um, targets both grasses and broadleaves. So some of the grasses that you might know, barnyard grass, um, large crabgrass, uh, the broadleaves that you might know, palmer pigweed, velvet leaf, things like that. Accent Flex technology in cotton was actually developed by Bayer, and then after all of the mergers happened, it kind of, it got taken over by BASF, and they're the ones that are kind of walking it towards the finish line. The finish line is actually an estimated release date, heavy on the estimated, of 2024. Um, but isoxaflutol, this is actually not a new herbicide. You've seen it before. It's actually balanced that you can use in corn. And then there's also uh, isoxaflutol tolerant soybeans, and they call those the GT27. So this is uh, another slide that Bear sent me um, to talk about application and when you can apply isoxaflutol or Elite 27. 
So they're going to market it as a burn down product. You can put it out pre-plant, surface, or incorporated. Pre-emergence, which I wanted to point out, this is actually going to be the first herbicide tolerance trait that targets pre-emergence that we have in cotton so far. And then you can also put it out at cracking to emergence, and then that early post up to four leaf. This just lends a hand to the application flexibility of this product. And we were actually very um, fortunate enough to be able to do herbicide trials regarding pre-emergence, using this product as a pre-emergence and using it as an early post. So I'm actually going to address our pre-emergence trials first and then kind of give you an idea of what we're seeing pre and then we'll move into what we're seeing as an early post. So I had two trials that were uh, conducted across various locations across the Cotton Belt and I actually say I'm just going to talk to you about the three in Oklahoma. So the first trial is actually looking at Elite 27 in a bare ground setting. And to kind of just give you a big overview of what we saw, so we were just looking at pigweed control here, and at two weeks after treat, the treatment, so we put Elite 27 out along with um, Direct, Sinister, Prowl, and Warrant, and then various combinations of those. But our Elite 27 um, rates were two or three fluid ounces an acre. So we saw that control was similar regardless of the Elite 27 rate, early, early season, both years. And then along with the early season, all treatments provided at least 95% control except Direx, Sinister, and Prowl at Altus in 2021, and Warrant at Bigsby and Prowl and Altus in 2022. Now looking forward to the four weeks after the treatment, Elite 27, two or three fluid ounce combinations increased control over Prowl and Altus in 2021 but also both rates increased control over Prowl at two of the three locations in Oklahoma, uh, two of the three locations in Oklahoma for Warrant, and then Direx at one of the locations this year. So these pictures were actually taken the 2021 season, and we use this, the Prowl treatment, as kind of a precursor for what we moved into the cotton study this, this 2022 year. We were very intrigued as far as the pigweed control for the untreated check you can see here, the amount of pigweeds out there, Prowl alone, and then Elite 27 alone. But what really stood out to us was how clean the plot was between or with the combination of Prowl and Elite 27. So now we're going to move into my cotton study. Um, this study actually has eight treatments. Uh, and they'll be listed here, but again, 2022 is going to have um, Elite Plus Prowl, but 2021 will not. So we did not see any incidents of cotton injury uh, with the use of Elite 27, but also what was something that was, we wanted to point out was when you added Elite 27 to a tank mix with something like Direx, it did not increase the cotton injury. So looking at uh, Palmer amaranth or pigweed control, two weeks after planting in 2021, we actually didn't have any significant treatment differences. But I'm going to use this slide to kind of set up what the rest of the um, charts are going to look like throughout the rest of this PowerPoint. So on the y-axis, we have percent control, and that's a visual percent control. The x-axis is our different treatments. And then um, each bar, the color of the bars, is denoted by a different location. So pigweed control, two weeks after planting in 2022, we did not have any significant differences at Altus and Fort Cobb. However, if you take a look at the differences at um, Bigsby, you can see that the Elite 27 and Direx, well, actually all three of the Elite 27 combinations plus the Sinister alone provided, better, or provided among the best weed control for Palmer amaranth or pigweed. And then moving on to this is a four weeks after our post treatment. So we did put a post treatment out of Ingenia Outlook Roundup. Um, this was four weeks after that in 2021. We didn't have significant differences at Altus or Fort Cobb. 
However, um, the treatments, the Dyrex, Sinister, Elite 27 and Dyrex, and Elite 27 and Sinister were among the top um, for weed control. Now moving on to what we saw this past year at four weeks after planting, or I'm sorry, four weeks after the post-treatment. We didn't have significant differences at Altus. However, when you look at Bixby, uh, the sinister, the treatment sinister, Elite 27 Direx, Elite 27 Plus Prowl, those were among the best control for pigweed four weeks after that post-treatment. And then moving on to Fort Cobb, the applications or all three of the tank mix applications, the Elite 27 plus Direx, Prowl, and Sinister, and that Direx alone were among the top. Now moving on to grass control. So this was at three different locations. We had three different species of grass at all our locations. So we had um, large crabgrass, we had red sprangle top, and we had Texas panicum. In 2021, we did not have any significant treatment differences. However, in 2022, we were seeing kind of a separation there. So first we'll start with Altus. At Altus, when you combined Elite 27 with Dyrex or Prowl or Sinister, it increased the um, grass control. Now moving over to Bixby, when you combined um, Prowl with Elite 27, it increased control compared to just prowl alone, and then looking at Fort Cobb, same different or same thing, same situation. When you combine prowl with Elite 27, it com it increased control compared to just prowl alone. Now looking at grass control at four weeks after the post treatment, we did see significant treatment differences here at Fort or at Fort Cobb in 2021, where all treatments. Um, Direx, Prowl, Sinister, and then the combination of Elite and Sinister controlled um, grass better than just Elite alone. Now looking at 2022, we had treatment differences at all three locations. Again, uh, when you combine the Direx and Prowl with Elite 27, you increase control. Uh, and looking at Bigsby, when you combine um, Prowl with Elite 27, you increase control. And then again at Fort Cobb, uh, the Elite 27, when it was combined with Direx or Prowl, it increased control there too. Something I did want to point out was the tank mix treatments were the only treatments that actually provided consistent among the top control at all three locations. Now we'll move on to one of the studies we looked at with Elite 27 as a post application. This was actually only conducted at two locations in Oklahoma. So we had Fort Cobb and Altus. We actually didn't see any um, crop response to the Elite 27 when it was applied post. However, BASF is saying that they have seen some crop response. They say it's up to about 15%. Um, when it's applied early post. One thing I did want to point out, our study that we did, it was Elite 27 at three ounces. This slide here that BASF has for me, they put it out at six ounces. So that could kind of contribute to it. So first we'll take a look at pigweed control. This was two weeks after the post treatment. So um, before I start with that, I'm going to define all of our treatments here on the bottom. So E is Ingenia, O is Outlook, L, Liberty, R is Roundup, and A is that Elite 27. And then again, the different colored bars denote the different locations. So we didn't have treatment differences at Altus. However, at Fort Cobb, you can see that the addition of Elite 27 did increase control, whether that was a three-way tank mix or the two-way tank mix. Now, uh, pigweed control at four weeks after the post-treatment. So at Altus, there were significant treatment differences, and basically the trend follows Ingenia. And so you can see here, this, ingen this is an Ingenia treatment, this is an Ingenia treatment, and this is an Ingenia treatment, and they were all among the top 
as far as weed control goes. And then um, at Fort Cobb, we also had differences there. And you can see, kind of follows the same trend. The Ingenia treatments all were among the best for the pigweed control besides uh, that four-way tank mix of Liberty Outlook Roundup and Elite 27. Now moving on to grass control. So this is two weeks after the post-treatment. There were treatment differences uh, at Altus and again, kind of follows the Ingenia trend. So all of the tank mixes with Ingenia except for this um, four-way tank mix with Liberty and the Liberty with um, Elite 27 were among the top. And, but I did want to point out that the Liberty tank mix, the four-way tank mix, did control grass better than just the three-way without uh, Elite 27. And then looking at Fort Cobb, um, kind of the same trend follows. So the Ingenia treatments, uh, all were among the best when it came to weed control. Now this is grass control four weeks after the post-treatment. Again, Altus didn't have any significant differences. However, the trend kind of became more defined here with the Ingenia. So when you added in Ingenia to the tank mix, those were the best control for um, there was Texas Panicum. So to kind of wrap everything up, and that was a lot of data just to kind of give you some take home points. So Elite 27 as a pre, as far as pigweed control goes, when you, it, the increasing the use rate of t Elite 27 from two to three ounces did not provide an early season weed control advantage. Um, there's consistent late season control with Elite 27 plus Dyrex over both years, and that was at least 95% control except for at Altus this past summer. Now, Elite 27 and Prowl was equivalent to the best treatment late season at all ex locations except Bigsby in 2021 and does continue to be among the top. Now, that's something that I wanted y'all to think about when we were looking at these treatments. Elite Plus Direx does stick out. However, Elite Plus Prowl is a very good option as well. And this is Prowl H2O. Let me mention that. Prowl H2O actually provides a little bit better control on some of those tougher annual season grasses like Texas Panicum, for example. And there's also less potential for early season injury when you use Prowl H2O. So that's kind of compared to some of those other residual herbicides that you commonly see in cotton. So Dyrex, Cotteran, and Sinister. Now looking at Elite 27 as an annual grass control standpoint as a pre. In 2021, all treatments did provide at least 96% early season grass control, while in 2022, the only treatments that provided at least 96% control across all three locations were the tank mix combinations. And while all treatments provided at least 90% control of annual grasses, and that was all except the Elite 27 at Cobb and Simster at Bigsby in 2021, the only treatment that provided at least 90% control at all three locations in 2022 were the tank mix combinations. Now, we'll kind of shift gears to look at it as an early post. So as far as pigweed control, some of the take homes for that, the addition of Elite 27 or the substitute of Elite 27 for Outlook did increase early season pigweed control. And then although Ingenia tank mixes and the four-way Liberty tank mix were among the best for control, the addition of Elite 27 to the three-way Liberty tank mix did increase late season control at Fort Cobb. And then looking at annual season or annual grass control, the addition of Elite 27 provided an increase in early season control in the four-way Liberty tank mix at Altus, but the three-way tank mix with Liberty at Fort Cobb increased both early season and late season control when mixed with Elite 27 instead of Outlook. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for your time. Also, I'd like to thank BASF and Cotton Incorporated and the Cotton Council for funding. Thank you, Jenny. Oh, we got questions. Okay. Come on, y'all. What species of pigweed is the best result? Red or smooth or Matter. That's a good question. I'm not sure. I'm not sure exactly what species we have at all three of those locations. Palmer. Palmer. 
There you go. Palmer at all three. Yeah, so the, he asked if the pre-emergent application was incorporated with irrigation. So we actually only have irrigation at two of those three locations. So we have irrigation at Fort Cobb overhead, and we have overhead irrigation at Bigsby. At Altus, we're kind of up to the water district as far as when we can get water and rain. And so it, we were pretty timely with our incorporation at those two locations where we have overhead irrigation. But at Altus, we're kind of at the mercy of Mother Nature. So did you put it... Did you spray it, then irrigate it in, or did you do chemication? No, we sprayed it and then irrigated it in. All right. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you. All right. Well, follow Jenny up with. Any better? Okay, there we go. Okay, as Dr. Arnell said, I'm Zachary Treadway. I'm a PhD student under Dr. Bauman there at OSU in Ardmore. I'm going to take a little time today, take a little of your time, talk about some work we've been doing with residual herbicide programs in Oklahoma soybean. So I just move in just a quick, some things we all know. I'll start and kind of move in. Why is it important? Why do we even do weed control work? You know, why, do, why do weeds matter? Most everybody knows a weed is going to compete with a soybean or any crop for, for any of the inputs that a crop needs to be successful. Be that water, be it sunlight, nutrients, space, etc., etc. A weed and a crop are not going to coexist. One's going to choke out the other. And more times than not, your weed is going to choke out your crop and, and you're left up with your head in your hands. So it's important that we have people that do weed work and, and that we keep trying to advance weed work and, and, and make steps to help the producer when it comes to managing weeds. So just a quick, a quick bullet that I like to use with a lot of my presentations in terms of Palmer Amaranth. I feel like Palmer Amaranth is probably public enemy number one when it comes to weeds. A severe Palmer Amaranth infestation, if we leave it alone, if we don't do anything to it, we can see soybean losses of over, yield losses, excuse me, of over 45%. So I mean, I think it's rather important that we try to manage our Palmer or any weed or, or we'll, end up, we'll end up in the red, which is not where any of us really want to be. Okay, so weeds, um, they're not just a one-time headache. If we don't manage weeds, we have problems from, from planting to harvest. Uh, if, we, if we have weeds competing with germinating crops, we're looking at crops that are going to be choked out, they're going to be stunted, and a stunted crop more times than not is going to lead to a crop that's not giving you maximum yields. And that's just where it starts. It starts at, starts at pre-emergence. It starts at, excuse me, starts at emergence, starts early in the season. Um, but it can be a problem year long. Uh, if we have mid-season weeds, they're going to compete with our crop. They're going to stun our crop. They're going to hurt our yield. And then when we get to fall, we get to harvest. Um, we we could, could be in a situation where weeds are too thick to even get a combine through the field. Uh, if we have weeds that have outgrown a crop, we're not going to be able to harvest. If we do get in there to try to harvest with a severe weed infestation, uh, those thick, those thick stem palmer pigweeds, a lot of times, are going to clog up our combines. They're going to slow our harvest down. I know a lot of the producers in here, if your wheels aren't rolling, you're not making money. If we're having to fix combines or unplug combines, we're not making any money. So weeds are going to be a headache from beginning to end if we don't do something about them. I'm going to stop off here real quick, just kind of why it's important, and, and touch on herbicide resistance for just a second. Um, the case nationwide, not just in Oklahoma, but in Oklahoma and every state where crops are grown. Um, is going to be herbicide resistance. We're going to have weeds that just take herbicides on the chin and keep growing. Uh, in Oklahoma, we have confirmed resistance to our ALS herbicides, ACCA's herbicides, and of course glyphosate. Um, we all seen Roundup resistance. There are weeds that drink up Roundup like water and just keep moving. Um, our weeds, we look at like our amaranthus species, and that's our palmer pigweed, our tall water hemp, our, our smooth and rough pigweed. Those species, we see some, do see some, some resistance there. Kosha. Horseweed or mare's tail, 
uh, Italian ryegrass and a few others that we have confirmed resistance to. So those are, those are real problems. And kind of what that means is we can't always put the full brunt of weed control on our post options. Because if we have resistance, our post options really aren't going to do much for us. If it's a weed, say like a palmer amaranth that's glyphosate resistant, we can't count on glyphosate to do that job for us post. So what we have to do, we have to find ways to work around that resistance, to use what we have, use what's still working to work around herbicide resistance so we can successfully get that crop um, out of the ground growing and then out of the field. So this is, this is I, I'm kind of hoping Dr. Baldwin doesn't have this slide because I did borrow it from him. I probably should have asked him before I did. But I really like when we talk about this that, that the cheapest form of weed control, cheaper than any herbicide at all, is prevention. And I see Dr. Arnell stepping out. I think he'll like this one though. The first point when it comes to prevention uh, and how to control weeds is to raise a good healthy crop. We want to make sure our soil is good. We want to make sure we, we're feeding that plant, we're fertilizing, we're keeping our, keeping our pH, we're keeping everything where we need it to grow a healthy crop because a healthy crop will compete with a weed uh, a lot more so than a crop that's struggling or deficient will. Um, that second point there, rogue fields of new infestation. So if we, I don't know, let's say we don't have, we don't have horse weed on our farm. We, don't have, we haven't seen horse weed, but we go out to plant next year, we go out next spring, and we have a horse weed infestation. The best thing to do at that point is to get rid of that infestation. Whether it's cold steel, whether we're burning it down, we need to get that infestation out before one field of horseweed, one field of mare's tail spreads and become a, becomes a farm full of mare's tail. So if we nip it in the bud, like Barney Fife, we nip it in the bud in the very beginning, we can keep that horseweed from spreading and keep it from becoming uh, a farm-wide problem. That third point there, we want to manage our turn rows, our fences, our corners, and our ditches. Places that our big sprayer may not reach, we need to get in there with a spot sprayer or a small sprayer or a hoe or something because you know, it may be in a turn row, maybe on a ditch bank this year, but if we don't manage it, next year we're on field margins. And next year we're out into the field, and before we know it, what was a ditch bank problem has become a field problem. So we need to work those small areas and keep them from becoming big problems. The next point there, we want to combine our worst fields last. It's pretty self-explanatory. Um, if we have a field that we're working to get a Palmer Amaranth problem out of, let's not pull the combine in there first. We pull the combine in there first, we pick up Palmer Amaranth seed, Palmer Amaranth seed gets everywhere and sticks to everything. Pull the combine in there first, we combine, we go to the next field, and what was a clean field this year, we've now seeded fully with Palmer Amaranth. So we need to combine those worst fields last, we can get out of those fields, go right back to the shop, clean off, get rid of those seeds, and not spread them from field to field. And finally, crop rotation. Um, let's give those chemistries a break. Let's not, let's not plant uh, extend flex beans in the same field every year. Let's give those chemistries, give those chemicals and herbicides a break. Let's rotate crops so we're not spraying the same thing every year and just building up resistance year after year. So fallow programs, this is something I kind of want to move through a little um, a chronological of, of the best kind of weed management practices. And this can start in the fall or the spring. A lot of weeds are going to germinate in the fall and the spring. And uh, the best time to control some of these weeds is in that rosette stage. So if we'll come in and we'll burn down in the fall or we'll, we'll burn down in the fall or we'll burn down in the spring, uh, we're, going to have a, we're going to have a cleaner bed to plant into, a cleaner field to plant into come late spring, early summer planting time. Just, just something to be mindful of and to keep an eye on uh, so we're starting clean. And that that there is no one, I can't stand here today and give you a fallow herbicide program that works for everything. There is no silver bullet approach. If there was, my job would be a whole lot easier. Um, fallow programs, or any herbicide programs for that matter, need to be developed off the weeds present and, and your weed problems. So there's something just to be mindful of that there is there's no, there's no one size fits all. It's just something, have to look at what we have and decide where we go going from there. Like I said, we must start clean to stay clean. Um, Look at the picture here on the left. Uh, it's kind of extreme, but if we plant into that, we're behind the eight ball all year. We're never going to catch back up. If we emerge, we're going to be choked out all year. It's going to be an issue. Planting into something like that is that's the only way to stay clean. If we plant into something clean, uh, you know, that's beds, that's tilled up beds. If it's no till and we burn down, we got to start clean or we'll never get clean again. So let me step off from the chronology real quick and talk about the critical weed free period. And this will make sense in just a second why I bring this up. So just to define that, uh, the critical weed-free period is the crop stage beyond which irreversible yield loss occur if weeds are present in the field. So just kind of break that down and get it out of, get it out of publication terms. 
It's the point that if there are weeds present during this period, we're going to see yield loss more times than not. It's, it's kind of in the name. It's critical that we're weed-free during this period. Um, so what that says is we want to preserve a weed-free environment during this time. It's crucial during this time to maximize yields. Um, in soybean, that critical weed-free period is somewhere between emergence and V3. So we want to stay clean between emergence and V3. And more times than not, that's about the first two to three weeks of growth in a, in a, a single crop conventional, um, excuse me, a single crop conventional style, not double crop beans. Now what I do want to add there is there are a lot of double crop beans in Oklahoma. Uh, with double crop being later in the year, it's hotter, there isn't as much moisture, those beans aren't putting on foliage as quick as, a, as, a, as an April or May planted bean. So the critical weed free period for a double crop bean is going to be a little past V3. Uh, it could be V4 or on, but just keep in mind that if we're growing double crop beans, we're just a little past that V3 for that critical weed free period. Stepping back in, I brought up critical weed free period to talk about residual herbicides. So the most effective way to preserve that a weed free environment during that critical weed free period is through the use of a, resid uh, of a residual herbicide applied pre-emergence. So there's been, there's been research done before that shows that, that more times than not, that a lot of times, that critical weed-free period is going to be covered by a pre-applied residual herbicide. So it's very important to, to maintain that critical weed-free period through the application of a, of a pre with residual activity. So the application of that residual herbicide is going to allow that soybean plant to get a head start, as I like to say, use that a lot, get a head start on any weeds that are, that are going to try to chase it down. Um, you know, whatever the weed is, but it just kind of allows that soybean to get up out of the ground, grow through, and kind of beat that weed to the punt so we're kind of at an advantage and we're not trying to grow with the weed, we're growing ahead of the weed and the weed is chasing us. So there's been some previous research done by Dr. Bauman and others here at Oklahoma State that's showing that using a pre-emergent herbicide, uh, it provides increased season-long weed control, which in turn produces higher yield consistently. So. I mean, it's pretty self-explanatory. It's, it's, it's not rocket science. If, we, if we're weed-free, our yields are going to be higher. If we're fighting weeds, our yields are going to be lower. So the application of a pre-emergent herbicide with residual is going to help us stay weed-free longer and yield higher. The same research I mentioned earlier that we need to be a little more careful about our double crop beans and our critical weed-free period, that same research showed that a pre-emergent residual herbicide is even more important in a later planted soybean. Now those double crop beans usually going in somewhere in mid to late June, could be early July. So it's very important that we get a residual pre out with those double crop and late planted soybean. So why does so I mean I ask a lot, why does it matter? So here's kind of why it matters. It's because we spray when we can. Uh, a lot of times our spraying is based on the weather. And and playing the weather is a gamble. I've been told since I moved here to Oklahoma that Oklahoma is in a state of consistent drought interrupted by intermittent flooding. I've seen that. I mean, it, it may not rain for three months, and then we get six inches in two days. So, so playing the weather is always a gamble. Uh, there are a lot of factors that go into when we can spray. Uh, how much spraying we can get done in a day, how much we get done in a month, or I mean, excuse me, a week or even a month. Uh, is it too wet? Is it too windy? Is there something like a temperature inversion? Is there something that's keeping us out of the field that keeps us, that's keeping us from getting across the acres we want to? So, um, you know, pre with little residual activity. It allows us to kind of breathe and not be so uptight uh, trying to chase down, trying to chase the weather and get a, get a post application out because that pre gives us a little time, to, uh, a little time to, to outgrow the weeds and gives us a little break if the weather's not wanting to cooperate with us. So with all that being said, I want to move into some work that we've done, uh, some field trials that I've, I've done the past, the past three years here in Oklahoma to look at different residual herbicide programs. Just a quick little rundown of, of what and where. These trials were conducted in 2021 and 22 across Oklahoma State University research stations. Uh, they're in Bixby, Haskell, and Lane, Oklahoma. So we planted Extend Flex soybean uh, in either May or June. Uh, the plots were 30 inch rows, they were 25 feet long. Each trial had four replications in it. And kind of here's the nitty gritty these are the four herbicides we used. The four, the four pre-herbicides we use at labeled rates. Uh, it's the first rate, Spartan, Tricor, and Zidua. So we applied, applied these as pre, we applied them alone, as well as in two and three-way combinations with each other. 
Now, all these treatments were followed by a post-application of Ingenia plus Roundup. Uh, just there was really no uh, timing per se. Just as needed, we made that one post-application. So throughout the year, we, uh, we rated visual weed control and injury by species. And also at the end of the year where we could, we, we harvested those small plots, adjusted that to three and a half, excuse me, 13 and a half percent moisture and got our yields. So we'll start here with Palmer amaranth. Uh, our two predominant weeds were Palmer amaranth and large crabgrass across all of our site years. And what I will start with, so across the bottom here are treatments with F first rate, S Spartan, T Tricor, and Z Zidua. Along our y-axis here is our percent control, uh, visual percent control. Across our X are our treatments, uh, our four herbicides by themselves, in two and three-way combinations, and our bars delineated by color. So we'll start by saying, if you look at the red bars here, Bixby in 2020, you can see those are a little bit lower. And we had a little problem getting out our irrigation, getting out our incorporating irrigation rainfall. And what that says, I think there's a point there, is it is very important to get Get those, get those pre's incorporated. I mean, the control isn't terrible, I mean, it's not, but it's lacking compared to the rest of them. I think it was a definite issue with getting our incorporating rainfall out, and we did see some lacking in control. For the most part across, we did see good control at two weeks after planting of Palmer amaranth. We'll move to a three to four week after planting timing, weather, perm uh, sometimes it was three, sometimes it was four, getting out there to look, it's just weather permitting and stuff like that. And we can see on these red bars again that we've really dropped down and gotten really low on our control across that Big Speed 2020 where we didn't get that incorporating rainfall out like we wanted to. We also see, we do see good, excuse me, we see good control with our three ways. Our three way tank mix is doing a really good job of controlling our Palmer amaranth. Our two ways are doing pretty well too, but our three ways are, are doing a really good job there controlling our Palmer amaranth. So this was two weeks after the post-treatment. This was the post-treatment I talked about, the application of Ingenia or Extend plus Roundup, a Dicamba, a Dicamba plus a Roundup. You can see here that for the most part, with just a couple exceptions, that after we made that post-application, that were pretty well over 90 with control of Palmer Amaranth. And what that says to me, that even though we didn't have the best control in that big speed of 2020, we had enough, uh, we kind of had enough buffer, we were we were well enough off that once we made that post application, we were able to get cleaned up, get cleaned up pretty well. Um, and that post is going to carry us to canopy. Usually once we get to canopy, the canopy handles the weed control and we're in pretty good shape. So what I really liked about that, and I'll harp on it again, is that even though those red bars were so low at, at the two and four week timing, they were good enough, we were able to clean those fields up fairly easy. So crabgrass, uh, crabgrass here was our, was, was our predominant grass for the most part. Uh, once again, those red bars with Bixby, we, I mean, the, like I said, they're decent, but they're not as good as the rest of the years. Has to do with that incorporating rainfall. Uh, we, saw a lot of, we saw a lot of success out of Zidua, out of Zidua containing treatments uh, in terms of grass control, be it in a two-way or a three-way mix uh, across most years. Anywhere we had Zidua, we saw pretty good grass control. Move into that three to four week application, excuse me, that three to four week after planting, rating, timing. And once again, our red bars are pretty low. But our two and three ways, uh, especially our, see, we've got a, our Zidua here, Zidua here, Zidua here. Uh, anywhere we have Zidua, we're having really a lot of success with grass control. I think that says something for Zidua in this situation that we did a really good job of controlling our large crabgrass when we include that in our tank mixes. This is once again after our two, week post, uh, two weeks after that post timing. And you see again, we were able to get that, those red bars. That Big Speed 2020 is back up pretty high again. So same with Palmer Amaranth. Uh, we had enough buffer there, even though we weren't great at two weeks after planting and four weeks after planting, we were still good enough to get it back cleaned up fairly easy and carry us on to canopy. So I talked about Lane, Oklahoma. Uh, the weeds at Lane, predominant weeds at Lane were just a tad different, so I didn't include them in the graphs, but I would touch on them here. In 2020 and 2022, tall water hemp was our main broadleaf species. In 2021, we had a large population of hemp cesbania. So in 2020, at, the, at that two week, that first rating timing, two weeks after planting, control was 98 to 100% 
with all treatments except Spartan alone or in combination with Tricor. In 2022, control of tall water hemp two weeks after planting was 97% or greater with all treatments. So just getting a pre out there this past year worked really good at two weeks after planting and controlling that tall water hemp for us. 2021, hemp cisbania, 98% uh, control with all treatments except for Spartan or residual alone. So for two of the four, we'll call them one way, not really mixes, just one way, one way pre's. We were at 98% control with pretty much everything else. Now, two weeks after planting with that broadleaf signal grass this past year, control was 92% or better of broadleaf signal grass, which is acceptable, we'll take that, with all treatments except that first rate alone. I'll touch on the first rate alone here, we move to the yield section. Uh, a little something with that first rate alone, but uh, we'll get there in a second. So we just kind of skip over that four week timing, really wasn't a lot to see there, but we move into this two week after the post treatment. So, so across, across all three years there at Lane, that was two years with tall water hemp and one year with hemp sesbania, uh, control of those broad leaves was 98 to 100% two weeks after that, after that post treatment. Uh, with all treatments except for residual alone in 2021 with a hemp sesbania. So across all years, that's 15 treatments per year, the 45 treatments, so, you know, one out of 45, we were 98 to 100% two weeks after that post. I mean, we, those pre's carried us along to the post, we got the post out, and we ended up okay. Uh, broadleaf signal grass, after that post went out, control was 97% or greater with all our treatments, except a Spartan alone, a Zidua alone, or a first rate alone. Those were all single modes of action, so all three of those single modes of actions gave us control less than 97%, but our tricor alone and all of our tank mixes were giving us control of greater than 97%. So our yield, I'll start at the top here. All of our treatments yielded higher than the untreated check. So if you don't, if you don't take anything else home from here than that, put a pre out. Because every treatment that got a pre yielded higher than the untreated check. So it's worth the money to put that pre out um, just based off that alone. Now our residual combinations uh, with just one or two exceptions were the only treatments that consistently yielded higher than the trial average across all locations and all years. So I'll say it again, any combination, any tank mix that included Zidua, those were the combinations that across all site years yielded higher than the trial average with the exception of the three-way mix of Spartan, Zidua, and first rate this year in Bixby. So for the most part, um, putting, putting Zidua in a tank mix uh, turned out pretty well for us when we fed those beans through the combine. Now, I told you I mentioned first rate alone. First rate alone was the only treatment we had that yielded equal to or less than the trial average across every location and every year. So we saw earlier that we were having a little trouble with, with first rate controlling grass. Could it be that? Could it, you know, could it be grass and broadleaf? You know, there's something there to that, that first rate alone did yield us less than the trial average across all site years. Just a couple more slides, I'll wrap up here and we'll We'll kind of get out of here, get, get off of mine and pass on to Dr. Bauman. So control of Palmer Amaranth at that two week after planting window, it was at least 98% across all site years. That's all locations every year. So every trial we put out, the combination of Tricor, Zidua, and Spartan at two weeks after planting gave us 98% or greater control of Palmer Amaranth. That was a very good treatment for us and it did its job very well. Now after that post application, all of those three-way combinations, so the, the three-way combinations we have, all of them after the post application gave us at least 97% control of Palmer Amaranth. So when we stack those, we got really good control of Palmer. Now moving on to our large crabgrass, at two weeks after planting, control was at least 90% with all treatments that included Tricor, except tri the two-way mix of Tricor plus Spartan. So all the combinations except Tricor, excuse me, all the combinations that included Tricor gave us at least 90% control, except in combination with Spartan. Now after that post application, control of broadleaf signal grass, excuse me, large crabgrass, control of large crabgrass was at least 95% across all site years with all combinations that included Tricor plus Zidua. So be that the Tricor Zidua two-way or the couple of three ways that included Tricor and Zidua, we had we had grass control of at least 95% two weeks after that post-treatment. This is kind of what I'll leave you with. This, this is what I'm going to leave with before I walk off stage here. 
Uh, weed management is a multifaceted approach. There's no silver bullet. There's no one way to do it. There's no, uh, there's no one-step method. It's a multifaceted approach that begins at fallow, and it goes pre, and it goes post, and it goes monitoring. Um, it's not just a one-size you know, one deal, something that, that keeps going and we can't really let up on it or we'll get behind. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, the first step to starting clean is staying clean. Burn down or till or something. Let's plant into a clean seed bed and that gives us a head start. Uh, as we showed here, a pre-emergence residual is critical to maximizing our yield and our weed control. Put down a pre. I'll preach it. I learned it from Dr. Bauman. Put down a pre. Um, but with that being said, a pre does not guarantee you season-long weed control. It, it guarantees you, for the most part, I want to say guarantee, guarantees are get you in trouble in this business. A pre, for the most part, will get you through that critical weed-free period, and then you'll be able to watch it and put out a post and let that post carry you through the end of the year. But that pre is a great place to start to maximize our yield. This last point here is very important. Uh, there, is no, there is no timing. There is no, well, four weeks after I plant and there's time to put the post out. There's no, there's no concrete timing on when to apply your post. Uh, we need to make a timely post before our weeds get too large and get too hard to handle. Um, so we just need to keep an eye. We need to monitor our weed situation and get those weeds sprayed at four inches or less. And so conclusion is usually the last slide. Add to this slide, I think it's kind of important, and it ties in to this last point here. That's a two-inch weed. We see that weed, and we don't think much of it. It's a two-inch weed, so we're getting pretty close to needing to spray that weed. But this picture on the right here is one that we took, took in our program. On May 16th, we planted this clean. On May 29th, we had, what is that? That's almost an 11-inch 11 11 weed. So that's how quick, that's how quick, they're two weeks, that's how quick that weed can get on you. So if we see a two-inch weed, time to be rolling the sprayer out and getting the chemical ready because we're not far from, being, from fixing to start spraying. Just keep an eye on that. Don't let our weeds get out of hand. Uh, let's make those timely applications, and we'll be good to go. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank Dr. Bauman, my professor. I'd like to thank the Oklahoma Soybean Board for their funding of this work. I'd like to thank Jenny, who was up here earlier, my colleague, for all her help. I'd like to thank uh, Robbie Peterson, who uh, used to work with us. He did a lot of help through my, through my, uh, through my research. And just all the research station personnel across Oklahoma. And for that, uh, thank you. I'd love to take any questions if I have any time. Yes, sir. Uh, so the question was, were all three of those sites conventional teal? And that was Lane, Bixby, and Haskell. And yes, sir, they were all conventional teal. I think you're all three down, Scott. Thank Great. you very much. Thank you. Okay, so transfer, we'll, we'll move into our Am I still on? Yeah. Yeah. Am I live? Yep, you're live. All right. <laughs> Good to go. Uh, let's give those three graduate students a hand. That was a great job. I know. For those of y'all that remember Tom Peeper, if he'd have asked me to do that when I was a student, I'd have probably wet myself up here. So they did a really, really good job, and I appreciate that. Secondly, for all of my uh, county educators out here, this is the last ODAF CEU meeting I'm doing. Don't call next week. <laughs> Don't call next week. Uh, with that, I'm uh, going to talk a little bit about some of the work that we've done the last year uh, in our research program. Uh, primarily going to concentrate on some of the stuff we've been doing with the new sorghum technologies, uh, partially due to the fact that Jenny stole my thunder on the Advent Flex cotton, uh, so really don't want to review that again. So we're going to talk a little bit about some of the things we're doing there, uh, that technology that's out there, how that's new, and, and how it can help us. Uh, but also how it's not, you know, a one-size-fits-all or are going to solve all of our problems either. Uh, with that, if we just look at kind of our standard programs, uh, dual outlook warrant, either alone or in combination with atrazine has kind of been the backbone of our sorghum weed control programs. I will say that, that we've done some work with the uh, 
mesotrions, products like Lumix, uh, and have seen good results with those. I think that's something that some guys should probably consider, uh, especially where they're dealing with either resistant pigweeds and or grasses. Uh, now the one problem that you have, we've looked at it quite a bit pre and we've had pretty good luck with it. Uh, there is an increase for potential injury if you go out pre rather than say seven or 14 days prior to planting. Uh, that definitely increases the safety of that material. Uh, but where we've seen some injury from it, uh, generally we've grown out of that initial injury and that's gonna be the whitening uh, that you would see from that kind of product. But we've never had an issue, at least so far, of growing out of any of that initial injury. Uh, with that being said, we're gonna talk about some of the newer technologies, the eye growth, uh, Double Team, and Ensign. Uh, these are being developed by three different companies uh, and are gonna give us some options for post-emergence grass control that we haven't had in grain sorghum in the past. Uh, with the iGrow system uh, and the double team both, it's actually a team approach between a seed company uh, and a chemical company. The seed company obviously developing the hybrids uh, and the chemical companies dealing with the chemistry side of that. With the iGrow, uh, the grain sorghum is coming out of the Advanta or Alta program. Uh, and the chemistry is being developed by UPL, which is Emiflex, uh, that's a Mazamox. That's gonna be the same thing as the Beyond product that you're familiar with in the Clearfield wheat systems. Uh, the double team, uh, the hybrids are being developed by S&W or Sorghum Partners, uh, and the chemistry is being developed by Adama, that's First Act or Quasolifop. Uh, so one of those FOP grasses that we've used in a lot of our broadleaf crops, uh, this technology is tolerant to it. And then finally, uh, the Enzyme program, and I probably, well, I've been working with the Enzyme program since I was at Vernon uh, with Texas A&M, so I have a fair amount of experience. Josh, I hope at some point we actually have several hybrids that we can grow and develop that technology. Uh, that currently has been taken over by Corteva. Of course, when they uh, merged with DuPont and Pioneer, the seed portion of that's the Pioneer part of Corteva. And then Zest is the herbicide, uh, Nicosulfuron, some of y'all may be familiar with it as Accent uh, in corn or Pastora uh, in pasture. Uh, again, as I mentioned, the, the seeds being developed from Advana, uh, this was an estimate price, I believe this was from two years ago, uh, Emiflex herbicide, again, uh, the Amazomox from UPL, uh, six ounces running about 18 and a little over 20 for the nine ounce rate, which is mainly where we've concentrated and seen our best results. Uh, of course, with the Emiflex, it has both grass and broadleaf activity, probably has more broadleaf activity than any of the other three new technologies. Uh, but the big problem with it and with the Zest, as we'll discuss earlier, is it is an ALS herbicide. So if you've got ALS resistance, out there, especially pigweed, uh, it's not gonna be real, real effective on those populations. Uh, it also has a longer residual than the other two herbicides, uh, but it's not gonna give you the residual, say, of something like Pursuit or Cadre uh, that we're familiar with in that class. It's gonna be a lot shorter than that, uh, which is gonna lend itself to much more open as far as rotations, which, you know, when we're thinking about grain sorghum, most of that's gonna be rotated with something else in the future. Uh, the double team, again, those seed is being developed by Sorghum Partners, uh, about six sixty dollars a pound. Uh, the first act uh, is basically a dollar an ounce. We've been looking at it at the 10 ounce rate, so we're looking at about 10 ounces an acre. Uh, but again, you're only looking at grass control with that particular product, so you're going to have to have something else if you've got any broadleaf escapes, which you're probably going to have. Uh, of course, again, that's with Salifop. That's a proven product. You know, it's been around for a lot of years. Uh, we know what it will do on a grass. Uh, we also know, you know, some of the things that can cause some issues with that. Uh, the biggest thing now, I'm saying do not tank mix it with other herbicides. Uh, the label uh, kind of has some language in there about visiting with your local sales rep or different people about potential tank mix options. Uh, but I think if any of us have had any familiarity with those products, we realize how sensitive they can be to mixing uh, with a broadleaf product, losing some of that grass activity, which is the whole reason that we're putting those out. 
Uh, so you want to be careful with those. Uh, oh, and I guess the one big thing is, uh, you know, at least in general, we're not seeing some of the issues at this time, at least in our summer annuals, as far as resistance to the ACCA uh, materials. Uh, the Enzyme product, again, it's been around for a, lot of time, a long time. We've been looking at, at hybrids for several years, and of course we've got a lot of experience with the Zest or the Nicosulfuron part of that. Uh, there may be some potential for SU grass resistance in some places, especially where there's been some heavy use in corn. Uh, so you kind of want to be aware of that uh, and watch that in some cases. Uh, does have good activity where you don't have a resistance issue. Uh, very limited broadleaf activity. It does have some broadleaf activity, but it's probably, you know, not something you would necessarily stand on. Uh, use rates are going to be 0.67 to 1.33 ounces. Again, probably going to be a little bit uh, better control on the higher end. Uh, we have seen some yellow flash out of that material on some of these hybrids. Uh, a lot of that is obviously, as you see with any of those SU materials, is kind of environmentally affected. You know, you get some cooler, wetter, wetter weather right after that application. Uh, you can potentially see some of that. And at least some of the initial hybrids seem to be a little more sensitive to just about any herbicide that we put out. Uh, the key with any of these systems um, and like I said, I've been working with these for a long, long time, is they're not going to be a one-shot post program, not any of the three. You're going to have to use them in some type of system. Uh, and obviously the biggest one uh, is a group 15 up front and then either atrazine up front or in combination from a post standpoint. Uh, and we've just seen that time and time again, that's a key to making any of these systems work. Uh, and of course, you know, Zach talked a little bit about this in his presentation, and I'll continue to stress, you know, the reason for a pre-residual program is, is several fold, but the biggest reason is most of our operators are huge anymore, and how can they get over all of their acres in a timely fashion without having some kind of pre-emergence herbicide down? Uh, and the other thing, not only is that because of all the weather, th conditions, it also sets up those posts and we continually see that and we'll see that in some data we have today about the fact that you're going to be out there on even smaller weeds in a lot of cases following those pre's which are going to make those post emergence herbicides more effective. Uh, again, all of these systems generally speaking are going to need some broadleaf help so you're going to have to bring in some of your traditional post herbicides, uh, you know, especially your phenoxies, your 2,4-Ds, your dicambas uh, are where we've kind of brought in most of our broadleaf materials to look behind most of these. Okay, the first one uh, talking about, we're going to talk about the Emiflex system. Uh, this is looking at pre and post for crabgrass control. This was at Bixby this past year. A uh, couple of things that I, I'd like to point out, uh, again, it shows the importance of having that metolachlor product out there pre-emergent. Uh, you can see that's as good or better uh, than the Emiflex alone. Uh, where we do see a slight benefit is in this early season uh, when we added that Emiflex pre. Uh, it did kind of level out as we moved out throughout the season. But again, what that does is sets that post application up where you get better control. Uh, with that being said, probably the best treatment that we saw uh, was that pre-emergence group 15 followed by an Emiflex plus atrazine. And you can see when we got out to 85 days, uh, almost 90% crabgrass control, which crab gra our grass control that far out in grain sorghum uh, is obviously something we don't typically see and is definitely beneficial. Uh, and we definitely see a benefit to having the atrazine in there compared to the Emiflex alone. Uh, so again, I think, you know, you're going to have to look at it in a system, uh, but when it's used that way, interestingly enough, and I'll show a little bit of data later, we see better grass control, I think, overall when we hold out on that post application, but that's not the case with, with pigweed. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, first act, this would be the first act. Uh, this is on the double team technology. Uh, first looking at, this would be Parallel Plus, which would be Metolachlor plus Atrazine down pre-emergence, uh, followed by a post application of first act. Uh, 
you know, out to 85 days, we were at about 75% control. The one thing that you have to think about is you're not going to get any residual out of that first act. You know, it's completely post-emergence. Uh, but again, you know, almost 75, 80% control late season, uh, pretty good control. Uh, we do see a benefit again to having some atrazine in that post application. Uh, and I did mention earlier, uh, we've done a little bit of work. We're not seeing the antagonism as much with the Clarity product uh, as we are with 2,4-D. Uh, now, whether that's going to stand up, I really, uh, like I said, a lot of times I get concerned about conditions and what some of those broadleaf products will do when our primary target is grass. But because I, so I'm still a little bit nervous about that. Uh, but then again, the atrazine helped us out completely. The other. Huh? A uh, court. Uh, the other thing I'd like to point out about this slide, if you look here at the end, uh, this is atrazine plus uh, clarity that went out early post and then followed by first act. And you notice that the control is down quite a bit, and there's a couple of things that kind of went on there, at least in my opinion. Number two, we were putting that first act on a lot bigger crabgrass than we were following these pretreatments. So, so, you know, you're trying to control a larger grass, which is number one, difficult. Number two, think about what happened mid to late season with our weather. When we were out here, we were on some weeds that had some decent moisture. Things looked a lot better in the season. Those were actively taking that up. Happens almost every summer in Oklahoma. Uh, when we got later in the season, we had those grasses were bigger. They weren't, didn't have the rainfall that we had early in the season, a lot tougher to control. So again, that's where that pre-emergence can help you tremendously. Okay, uh, zest post crabgrass control. And again, we saw the same thing with the zest in that same type of program. Uh, and obviously, by far the best treatment was where we had cinch ATZ, which would be metolachlor plus atrazine, uh, followed by zest and even out to 85 days, over 80% control of crabgrass with that program. Uh, so again, you can see the, the real benefit to having that pre-emergence. Uh, this was a post alone of the combinations. This can work, but your timing better be perfect. And obviously it wasn't perfect in this situation. Uh, that, you know, if you, when we planted these, we were about two or three weeks before we could ever even get back into the field to walk across them. And I can tell you, if we can't get a post-treatment out the way we do it, there's no way you guys are going to be able to get a post-treatment out. Uh, yes, I believe that's correct. Just to kind of re-emphasize, this is some work that came out of Kansas State, uh, Pat Greer and Randy Curry. Uh, John, you probably know Randy Curry. <laughs> uh, and it just kind of re-emphasizes, and the reason I put this in is how important grass size is to the use of these materials. Uh, it's just extremely, extremely important. So these treatments all went out on less than an inch tall grass. Uh, and essentially, if you look across all of those treatments, Flex, First Act, or Zest, uh, and really regardless of rate, you know, almost 100% control out to 42 days after treatment. So really, really good control on really, really small grass with all of those materials. We take that out to 15 inch grass and look what happens to every one of them. Control decreases tremendously. Uh, so again, it, 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 to me, this slide illustrates a couple of things. With all of these new technologies, timing is going to be critical, critical, critical for success with them. Secondly, it reemphasizes why you better have a pre-emergence down before you get to one of those post options uh, to make them work effectively in the systems that we're looking at. Uh, I did mention, uh, that's actually supposed to say first act plus 2,4-D. I don't know what happened there. Uh, this is just showing you what you can see from an antagonism standpoint, and I don't know how easy it is to see. Uh, but if you look here, yeah, there's some pigweeds in this particular plot, but you're not seeing any grasses to speak of. If you look real closely right there, that's some foxtail heads. Uh, there's some more foxtail heads. There's some more foxtail heads where we tank mixed it with 2,4-D. 
Uh, and again, this was some work that they did at K-State. Uh, but again, it just illustrates the potential that you can get into uh, when you start trying to do too many things at once with these materials, and especially with the first act material. Those, you know, those fops and dims have always been sensitive to trying to tank mix with the broadleaf product. Uh, I did mention, uh, talked about a little bit earlier, but this is just kind of some illustration of what we're seeing from a pigweed control standpoint uh, and some of the things that you need to think about. Uh, this is a uh, metolachlor at a pint, a pint and uh, three tenths. Uh, you can see again that excellent control, uh, of course, and it, you know, and it decreases as we get out to 85 days as we would suspect. If we look at the Emiflex at nine ounces, uh, really not even as good a control uh, as we see with the, with the metolachlor. Uh, the big reason at Bixby, we know this population is ALS resistant. Uh, and I will say, amazingly, we do get better control with that pre-application than we do a post-application. Uh, and, and we consistently see that. Uh, and that goes the same with some other materials that we look at at that particular station where we've got some resistance. Uh, if we look at the uh, metolachlor plus Emiflex pre-emergence, you know, if you look as, at most treatments, you're thinking, well, there's not really a benefit to there. But if we look at that 48-day treatment, that's over 90% control compared to 80%. Again, what that potentially could do is help us with that post-application to control some smaller uh, pigweeds out there. Uh, so you can see some benefits to that. Uh, again, I probably say as a whole, that system, what we see the most consistent results is where we use that group 15 and follow it up with an Emiflex plus atrazine. And you can see, uh, you know, almost 90% control out to 85 days. Same type of situation with Zest. Uh, of course, we're using the atrazine up front here, uh, but following that by Zest, and we're getting pretty good pigweed control uh, late season with that, with that situation. Uh, the other potential option, again, is to bring in one of your traditional broadleaf products and clean some of these up. And again, in the first act system, that's definitely what you're going to have to look at if you've got a pigweed problem. Okay, the other thing that's going to be critical with these technologies is stewardship. You know, uh, we've seen it with other technologies. We'll see it definitely with these and probably see it faster if we don't make sure that we steward these. If we try to overuse these systems on the same farm year after year, I can promise you in about three to five years, we're not gonna have the use of that technology on those farms. Uh, fortunately, each company uh, has developed guidelines uh, as far as stewardship is concerned. Uh, so we're gonna continue to see those uh, promoted, which is, which is good, uh, and that each, uh, uh, producer is going to be asked to participate in stewardship training uh, to try to make sure, you know, that, that we're using these as best we can. Uh, just some of the things that, in general, that, that we'll talk about, uh, again, that use of a pre-emergence herbicide, that's not only for the success from a weed control standpoint, but again, that's going to have another material out there that's going to help us control some of those potential risk resistant weeds. Uh, recommendations not to use in a Johnson grass or shatter cane field. You know, that's where the highest potential for resistance to these materials could possibly occur outside of the ALS uh, resistant pigweeds. Uh, so that, that's a real concern. You know, there's other ways to handle those species by crop rotation, uh, doing some different things there uh, that are gonna be much more effective uh, than using one of these tools and losing them for some of the benefits that we will see from them. Uh, we also obviously need to prevent outcrossing with Johnson grass and shatter cane, trying to keep those out of field edges, borders, those types of things, uh, so that we can't cause an issue. Uh, and then controlling your volunteer sorghum. Uh, you know, not letting those off types go out there and potentially cross uh, with Johnson grass or create a shatter cane that would be resistance to these. Uh, consider using a desiccant at the end of the season to control any escapes and minimize weed seeds production. That's going to be one of their recommendations. Uh, and then, you know, making sure that you do a good job of handling that seed 
uh, once you harvested off that field as far as trucking and transportation of that. Uh, just real quickly, uh, to kind of run through this, uh, ME Flex can be effective pre, uh, but it's still got to go out with a group 15, uh, not as good as atrazine or atrazine plus a group 15, especially on Palmer Amaranth. Uh, so, you know, if you've got pigweed, which most of us do, uh, you're going to need those other materials out there. And I would say in general, we've seen better results where we've used it post with atrazine following a group 15 as a whole, and are at least more consistent and more season long. Uh, all three of these materials can provide good grass control, but as I've emphasized several times, grass size is extremely important, uh, which again is one of those reasons that we need a good pre-program so that we make sure we're putting that out on smaller grasses. Uh, but we definitely can see good grass control with all three of those materials. Right now, uh, of course, I recommend being careful with tank mix and first act with any broadleaf material, but especially with 2,4-D, I think we've got enough information uh, that definitely you're probably going to see an antagonism issue there. All right, any questions about this before we move further? No, we've looked at it, at least so far, we've looked at it with clarity and haven't seen the antagonism that they're seeing with 2,4-D. But I know occasionally, you know, under the right conditions, just about any broadleaf herbicide, you can potentially see some issues. And I'm going back to when those were first developed and we were looking at them saying soybeans and cotton and different things like that. You know, if we mixed them with a certain broadleaf, you just almost say took your control down 10 or 20 percent, and it then depended really on the conditions that it went out on. I'm assuming that's a mean, but I don't know. That wasn't my. <laughs> yeah, I was going to actually say I was. I wish you wouldn't even have brought that up, considering <laughs> when those materials will go out. You know, if they were going out in March, be a whole different story than going out in the middle of, middle of June. Well, what about, what about deep, which is the best product? I'm not seeing any pigments there in the composition. I haven't looked at it, but I haven't heard of any uh, discussion. Right. Don't know that. Yeah, and like I said, I, d I just I don't have that information to speak of. Anything else? Yes, sir. Uh, you said not to mix those two chemicals earlier. Which one would you spray first, and then how long would you wait until you sprayed the other? So it's generally always been recommended to spray the grass material first and then spray the broadleaf. Here's always been my recommendation. If your grass is your number one problem, take care of your grass first. If your careless weeds are your number one problem, take care of your careless weeds first. So, you know, but now if you take care of the careless weeds, you're going to have to extend that period before you put the grass material out. You're looking at about two weeks, where you're looking at somewhere, say, between five and seven days to be able to put the broadleaf material out. Uh, but again, if, if pigweed, you know, we all know what pigweed, you know, because because I like to refer to, especially Palmer, as the boll weevil of the weed family. <laughs> and, it, and for you guys that are old cotton farmers, remember if you didn't control the boll weevil, it really didn't matter what else you did it from a cotton production standpoint. I kind of feel the same way about pigweed. If you let it get out of hand, it's really not anything that you're gonna do. But if your grass is your biggest problem and your pigweeds are just you know, kind of intermittent, then you need to take care of that grass material first. Okay, uh, this is a new PPO uh, that's being developed by BASF. Uh, this is the first year that we had an opportunity to look at it. Uh, we actually looked at it in peanuts. Uh, whether we'll actually see a label in peanuts, I'm not for sure. Uh, but part of the reason 
uh, that I brought this in was because it looks like we are going to see that material uh, in combination with sharpen, uh, probably both in soybeans and corn. Uh, and just to look at it, this is looking at it at one and two ounces compared to Valor at three ounces uh, in combination pre with prow. Uh, and then this was kind of the standard Valor prowl and pursuit as a pre-emergence program. Again, this was in peanuts. Uh, as you can see, we saw comparable control to Valor uh, on all three of our weed species. Uh, I would say this is probably a little better grass control than I would normally expect out of Valor. Uh, and that's Texas Panicum, which is pretty tough to control anyway. Uh, uh, but again, when we look at it compared to pigweed and, and morning glory, we actually saw better control with it on morning glory. When we added some type of grass material like prowl, uh, or I'd say probably something like metribuzin in soybeans, we saw an increase in control. A couple of other things that I might mention uh, that one of the things, if you'll notice, this is, a, this is a pretty high rate of valor. We normally go out at, say, an ounce or two ounces. Uh, but one of the things that we are seeing, at least in some of our areas, and this is a couple of things I might mention, is I'm sure we've got some PPO resistance out there. Uh, in fact, I'm sure we've got it at the station there at Bixby. Uh, and what we see with PPO resistance from a pre-emergent standpoint and that's part of the reason we're seeing some of the pre-benefit out of the Emiflex material is you still get control, it just doesn't last as long. Uh, because if you think about it, say you have Valor out there at two ounces, well to those germinating pigweeds, that's maybe like a thousandth X rate. Uh, but now if we have a resistance pigweed, that's all of a sudden, that's only like a half X rate to it. Uh, or a 2x rate. And so we see that material break down a lot quicker than what we saw uh, in the past uh, with those materials. And that's one of the reasons I think we're seeing better control out of that higher rate of valor. We're getting an extended residual from that material. Uh, the other thing, and again, to kind of make a point, again, this was, this was in peanuts, uh, but we're continually, as Zach illustrated, seeing a benefit to having some of these older materials if we have them tank mixed with something. Uh, we're consistently seeing a little bit of a bump in control when we have an ALS down pre as long as it's with either metribuzin or a PPO or something like that, even knowing we have ALS resistant herbicides out there. Take those materials and put them out post and it looks just like the mess that it was 20 years ago. Uh, but when we use them in combination, we do see a bump in control. And that's kind of what we're seeing here, and that's one of the reasons we've started looking at Pursuit again uh, in peanuts is kind of some of that work that we had originally done in soybeans. Uh, and, and we've seen some benefits uh, to, that, to that use rate. Okay, uh, this is a new product, or it's a new mix of some older products. Tendovo, this is being developed by Syngenta. We've looked at it at a couple of years. Uh, Again, I think one of the things that you see is that benefit to having that three-way mix in combination. Uh, and so, you know, not only do you see improved control in some cases, but you see an increase in spectrum of control uh, with a material like that. Uh, and again, this is another one of those examples where, you know, we'd kind of gotten away from ALS chemistry, chlorantulam, for those of y'all that's first rate. Uh, are similar to first rate. Uh, but again, we're seeing some benefits to that ALS material when we're using it in combination and using it pre-emergence uh, to these weeds. Uh, another product uh, that we looked at this past year, Trivolt, this was in corn. Uh, again, a three-way mix. Uh, and I think we'll see a, a continued increase of those types of things as we move forward. Uh, not only from trying to get around some of these resistant weeds, but also potentially to help us prevent some resistant development. Uh, this was at Bixby last year in corn. A uh, couple of things I'd like to point out. This is Trivolt 20 ounces plus atrazine. Uh, and this is late season control without any post-emergence product out there. Uh, so pretty good control from, from a, uh, you know, a single pre-emergence application. 
Uh, now this one you're wondering, well, Todd, you followed that up with atrazine or followed that up by Lattice plus atrazine, you didn't see an increased control, but this was a reduced rate up front. And so we saw similar control uh, following that reduced rate when we followed that up with something like Lattice plus atrazine. Uh, so I think this is some things that, that we're gonna have to continue to think about and look at uh, where we have some problems, uh, problem fields, uh, where we know we have some issues. Again, I think for some of our producers, you know, that are, are large acreage guys, you know, being able to manage all those acres in a timely fashion is going to make it more important, I think, that he has a good pre-program up front. The other thing that I think about, and I think a lot of times people go, well, you know, I don't want to spend all that money up front, uh, but we've seen some years where we get into a dry situation, a little bit like this year, I think, where we actually don't have to follow up a pre-emergence treatment with a post because we got that good control up front. So in some cases, we've seen a benefit to having that out there even under drier conditions. Uh, I think this is the last one. Uh, my dad said never keep a man between you and the bar, so I'll try to slow this down as much as I can. But this is Reviton. Uh, this is a burn down product. Uh, originally, the thought was uh, I think was the hopes that it possibly could replace Paraquat. Uh, we've done some burn down work with it. Uh, depending upon the weed and the conditions, it's not a replacement for Paraquat for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, when we get into those drier conditions in the middle of the summer, that's where Paraquat really shines for us. Uh, secondly, it's a PPO. So if you've got PPO resistant pigweed out there, you're not gonna get a whole lot of activity. And we've seen that at Bixby with this post. Uh, but one of the places that we have seen uh, some real benefit is using it for cotton regrowth suppression. Uh, and this is, this is our regrowth ratings. This is looking at both terminal and basal regrowth. Uh, and we can see similar activity to AIM or Sharpen, which are also PPOs that we traditionally use. Uh, and, you can, and this is just a comparison to Folex, uh, which any of us that are familiar with Folex and cotton regrowth know that's just a a regrowth, it's like fertilizer as far as regrowth, if it's a regrowth year. Uh, but you can see the benefit uh, to coming in with one of these materials, and it's showing comparable results to what we've seen with some of the other products in the past. Uh, last point. Uh, so I don't know how many of you guys remember, say, presentations I made five or six years ago not really feeling like in the Ingenia or the Extendamax Extend Flex system uh, that we had a real fit for Ingenia Pre, primarily uh, because I was looking at it from a pigweed standpoint uh, and really not seeing a real benefit to having that out there pre. Uh, but we've, the last couple of years, we've been looking at it on Morning Glory and it does look like it has a potential fit, especially if we've got some materials out there that are not as good on morning glory, say some of our group 15 materials. You know, if that's our primary base as far as our pre-emergence. Uh, the other one that, that we've, we're gonna be looking at in the future, uh, we've been doing a lot of work with Sinister and Cotton, uh, and morning glories has been one of the weakness of that material up front and so we're thinking pre-mixing maybe some Ingenia or Extendamax with that uh, could be beneficial from a morning glory control. Uh, so again, that's something that we're gonna expand on, but it definitely looks like it's got some positives to us. Uh, last couple of things, again, as mentioned, uh, Jenny mentioned the Accent Flex cotton. Uh, I think that has some real potential for us, especially mixed, I think especially tanks mixed with Prowl on some of our real, real sandy cotton soils that are susceptible to injury from some of our older materials that we traditionally use. Uh, so again, I think that's got some real promise as she mentioned. This is the one, I, I've been to a couple of meetings and several companies have been talking about putting PPO tolerance into several crops. Uh, where that's gonna go, I'm not for sure uh, for a couple of reasons, one, uh, again, we're having some issues with post-emergence use of the PPOs with resistance on pigweed already. Uh, and then secondly, uh, you know, we throw one more material in there, how are we gonna control volunteers? Uh, and then if we think about cotton, you know, I just mentioned Reviton, AIM and Sharpen to control regrowth. 
which are all PPO, so now we don't have a regrowth suppression material out there in cotton. Uh, so I don't really know where that's going to go, but it is something that I know several companies are looking at. Now whether that's going to increase tolerance to a, to a pre-emergence where we could go with higher rates, that could potentially be beneficial to some degree. Uh, with that, uh, I'd like to thank all of our commissions and boards for the support of this research. Without that, uh, I couldn't have two great graduate students like I got or run up and down the road. Uh, so I definitely appreciate them. Uh, any other questions, I'd be happy to address those. <laughs> Any questions for Todd? They're like, nope. <laughs> They're ready to go. <laughs> Thank you, Todd. A uh, couple things to clean up. One, one, my side of him, you guys hit a heavy dose. And I'm need to know about free food anyways um so so with that posters i thought went great a lot of numbers um, last year we had uh 12 or 13 posters year before we had seven posters this year we had 21 posters with a couple extras in just because uh these top three students will get awarded a scholarship it's uh, in honor of dr bill ron so he had some money held away and we've held those monies to make sure that students are going to get that for the couple years and I'm going to maintain that scholarship so the Bill Ron basically poster memorial scholarship will maintain levels of both masters and PhDs uh, we hope to extend this y'all noted that it wasn't just my kids or Josh's kids or Jason's that it's division wide we had Hort uh, a lot last year we had bio Simpsons winner so we're really trying to make it a division wide uh, poster setup with that, our top three for our master's students, we have number one, or number three, we'll go backwards. Gabriel Jesus, Gabriel, you in, come on up here. Gabriel did the sensors in Bermuda grass. <laughs> Two, and so he's a, he's a Rockatelli grad. Two, Samson Ebola, and Samson, I know I messed up your last name. Where's Samson at? Samson. <laughs> G by N in wheat, Dr. Silva in the wheat team. And then number one for the masters, Miss Brenna Cannon with the TAPS program in cotton. So uh, Dr. Warren uh, grad is our number one. So congratulations to the masters. We have uh, now our PhDs and we'll get, get the masters pictures and then we'll get the PhDs too. So PhDs are top three. And again, thank you for every one of the poster judges. I know it's something out of the realm for y'all, but having these students talk to the clientele, I think is much more important than having them talk to the scientists. So I think it's a huge part of what we're doing. So number three, uh, Mr. Haytem Mole. So Haytem did the sensors and soils. He's one of mine. And of course we have a tie for number one. So we have a first place tie. Uh, the first winner of our first place tie, Elena Gerhardt. Elena? Low lignin alfalfa. Uh, she is now in, actually in the animal science department, correct? Doing her PhD and she'll be presenting on low lignin alfalfa tomorrow in our forage section. And then our other one, which is shocking. I can't believe the judges picked this as a top one. Uh, but Katie with the hops program, Stenmark. I don't know how you say Katie's last name. I should have known hops was going to rank high no matter what, how you did. But congratulations to all the poster presenters. 